This is Life, Body, Business, Impact with Fatima. Welcome, friends. I am so grateful to have you here. I'm your host, Fatima Ingalls, fitness expert, best-selling author, lifestyle entrepreneur, founder of the Life, Body, Business, Fit Systems, and co-founder of the amazing Freedom Retreats. My mission is to positively impact 10 million lives, to inspire you to wake up and live from your bucket list of dreams instead of waking up one day with a bucket list of regrets. Get ready to be inspired with weekly episodes and interviews that disrupt your thinking and motivate you to build your best life, body and business. To change one life is to change many. So come with me now and let's get started with yours. Hello friends and welcome back to another episode. Today I'm chatting with Michelle Richards. She is the owner of The Base Transformations in South Australia, a successful entrepreneur having owned two very successful businesses in the fitness industry. She's a fitness and bikini model champion having represented Australia in Spain, Madrid. So absolutely amazing. She creates bodybuilding champions, men and women. She's a mother, she's a plant-based practitioner, functional diagnostic practitioner so, so what that means is she it allows her to act as an integrative coach geez i can never get that word out right anyway she has attended silent retreats three of them where it requires you to sit for days on end meditating not speaking to anyone no contact with the outside world which is inspirational all in itself Michelle has also taken the huge step to have her breast implants removed for the sake of her own best health. So I'm so excited to get into the interview with her and share all the wonderful information that she has got to share with all of us. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. It's so fantastic to have you here. Thank you. I really appreciate you yeah, being invited on and really excited to have a chat. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the conversations that we're going to have. Let's begin with sharing um, with our listeners some of your background story. So mm-hmm. where did you begin in relation to your health journey and mm-hmm. where are you now? Just in a couple of minutes. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, yeah, going right back to 2008 is the first time I was introduced to bikini competing. And that was probably at a good age where it took me away from a party scene. So, yeah, it was a great goal at that time to really get into the gym and focus on what I'm eating and eating clean. Yeah, it just gave me a really good purpose. And then I guess fast forwarding now a long time, <laughs> 2008. 19, what are we at? 20. Yeah, 2019. (laughs) Wow. So yeah, pretty much 10 years on. That's crazy to think of it. Yeah, now I'm more down a holistic path in terms of health and, um, you know, just female health and hormones and, um, you know, just now moving more towards a more holistic approach to how I approach my own health and how I can now help other women um, with their health. So yeah, definitely has been an amazing journey and, um, yeah, from where I was, I guess, reflecting back to 20, 2008 to now is, yeah, lots of changes. Definitely. What was the attraction to the bodybuilding scene to start with? You've got so many accolades. You've, you've had so many successes <laughs> in your own right. And mm-hmm. you've also, which we can talk about after, but you've also coached a lot of women and men to mm-hmm. amazing success. And how we first met in 2012 was on the bodybuilding stage. Yeah. So what attracted you to that? In 2008, my sister had a friend that worked into a, in a supplement store and he just sort of said that I had a bit of potential and I looked pretty fit. So it would be an awesome goal to work towards. So he actually signed me up. So I actually didn't even know what I was getting myself into. Um, so my first experience competing, um, there was not a lot of preparation or really any idea what I was meant to do Um, got up on stage and tied third and from there is when I sort of got a taste of it and I thought no this is something I actually really want to do and try and actually do well at so from there that's sort of what planted the seeds and got me hungry for it and pretty much competed every every year after that and season seasons back to back as well so that's sort of yeah where it all started I always was very athletic but not so you know a cardio bunny so I think that's why the attraction to competing was getting strong getting into the gym and lifting weights and yeah so that's sort of where it all began 
So you like the idea of actually getting strong? Yeah, 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 because I was probably a bit more skinny back then. Um, so, yeah, I really like the idea of, like, sculpting my body and probably the um, physical rewarding feeling from feeling stronger as well. Mm. I wasn't really a cardio bunny, but I was obsessed mm. with staying skinny and on mm-hmm. and off the scale several times mm-hmm. a day yeah. until I until I got into training and then just absolutely loved that feeling of getting stronger. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sure you come across a lot of women or have in the past that are a little bit afraid of lifting the weights. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you have to say to them and how do you encourage them? Um, I'm careful with the language I use, but, yeah, ultimately I just explain to them that it's unfortunately not that easy (laughs) to build a lot of muscle. And as females, we generally don't have that hormone profile to build huge amounts of muscle very quickly um so I just use that language of it's more about toning and sculpting the body and um then when they look at it from that perspective they start to enjoy it and it's really then introducing them into the gym and how they feel um and most of them love it and that's when they really see the changes in their body and what about from a health perspective um aside from a obviously there's an aesthetic perspective Mm. to it but do you speak to them about the health perspective of building more muscle on the body Yeah, definitely. You know, with more mature women, especially, you know, we lose the ability to maintain lean muscle after a certain age. So weight training is really good for that. For people with a lot of blood sugar issues or diabetics, like weight training is the best thing to help, um, you know, work with the high sugar in their body. It's a good way to just channel it into the muscles where the body won't naturally do it as efficiently. Yeah, so definitely I touch on the health side as well, like the advantages of doing the weight training. Um, Also just with women and stress hormones. So, you know, doing those long duration cardio workouts, you know, we know we're going to be outputting a lot more cortisol, which makes it more difficult to shift body fat around the midsection. So often they tend to see once they start to do more efficient training and a bit more resistance training, um, their body just cooperates with them better. Okay, wonderful. Going back to competing, what was your greatest moment? You've probably got so many, Mm. but what was one of your greatest moments through um, being on stage and competing and why? My favourite comp I did was the WFF NABBA Southern Hemispheres. Um, So that was... 2012 and that was probably the most rewarding feeling um I put a lot into that prep and I wouldn't say I just put a lot into it in terms of physically there was a lot of that sort of setting the intention visualizing like I really brought that other element to it um and I feel like that is what made it feel more rewarding because you know I really tried to give it more meaning I, I got to a point with competing where you know winning for me was one thing but winning with more purpose really meant more to me so I really did link that to a lot of other thing purposeful things so I think it made it feel more um just more fulfilling not just oh here's a trophy it was more about the journey yes yeah definitely so what was some self-discovery that you had along the journey because myself the the years that I competed were always mm. very different and for different mm-hmm. reasons mm-hmm. and even when I didn't um, win a trophy that was one of the comps that you know I had the most lessons I pushed through the most pain and the most challenges mm-hmm. and obstacles than in previous competitions where I had achieved the trophies so mm-hmm. what were some of those personal lessons I got to a point where having a great body didn't wasn't a satisfying goal for me so I felt like I, I I wanted to achieve this for a greater good for a bigger purpose so you know being in the fitness industry and being a health coach I I felt like in myself like I had to work out well what means a lot to me and, and you know helping other people was a really high value of mine so I wanted to make sure during that journey the things that I shared were more in line with you know the mental journey that you go through and that mindset um you know also just sending good messages out to other people and that's where I sort of linked my goal of doing well with okay well if I'm if I feel I deserve this I need to do something good with this so I felt like using that energetic thing where you know if you want to attract something into your reality you really need to already be grateful for it and know that you're going to do good with it so um you know I would journal write a lot and just self-reflect a lot so um that was probably a big one for me and it just made me feel more inspired and more driven to really want to give it everything that's beautiful um was it was it at that point or sometime after that point close to that point that you started coaching other women 
it was the year after that where the coaching started. Yeah, so it's sort of that was the probably the stepping stones to get there. I was already PTing people and it was the very early stages of actually starting to coach people. Michelle, did you feel pressure to look a certain way in the fitness industry when you were competing and even when you stopped competing? Yeah, definitely. Like after I did my last show in 2014, um, I actually had some health challenges and it made me not be able to train the way I normally would. Um, which, you know, obviously from a stage body to an everyday body, there was a difference. Um, and, yeah, it probably did make me feel not – I had identified with looking that way for so long, so it definitely was a challenging time for me, and I did notice I did withdraw from the world a little bit at that time and social media and, and that, and I just needed to um, remove myself and – looking at other images that would make me compare myself and feel less of myself. Um, but over the years, that's definitely what then put me down a path of, yeah, wanting to, you know, just learn to love myself the way I was and know that, you know, I, I'm more than just this physical body and that, you know, it really just came down to how I perceived myself and being mindful of my influences around me and what sort of things I was comparing myself to. So just was a journey of becoming more mindful um, and just really, yeah, learning to love myself and accepting myself exactly the way I was and knowing I can always change, but that's only ever going to happen if if I accept where I'm at right now and doing it for the right reasons. So that was, yeah, a big, big journey for me going from there to where I am now. Yeah, it's a journey that so many women and I think a lot of men are experiencing as yeah. well at, at several stages. We were talking just before, you know, I've had my own journey of, feeling the pressure to look a certain way, but it's it's a wonderful place when you come to that place of not needing mm-hmm. to to live up to those self imposed those self imposed kind of images or expectations, if you like. Yeah. Definitely. And it, and it's wonderful that it sent you off on that path. Mm-hmm. You've shared your story of breast implant removal. Now mm-hmm. women getting breast implants, it's so normal these days. Mm-hmm. Talk to us a little bit about your breast implant removal journey because you, you shared it publicly. Yes. What led you to remove them? What was happening for you? I was actually about seven months pregnant when I first got exposed to some information on the health effects of breast implants. And when I discovered that, I sort of got a little bit overwhelmed and I realised, well, right now I can't do anything about this. Like I need to obviously have this baby and, you know, and I really wanted to breastfeed. So I did sort of just put it to the side, but I always had in the back of my mind, I'm going to really look into this properly once I stop feeding. And I really had already made, I didn't actually need to know much more than that. I already had in my mind, these things have got to go. Because to me, one of my highest values is my health and that's not something I ever want to take for granted or ever risk. Um, You know, if I don't know 100% that they're not going to make me sick, that's not good enough for me. Like I'm just not prepared to take that risk in life. So uh, once I'd had Rylan, that's when I started to research into it a little bit more and there's some great information on the breast illness. There's a few online ones that I can share with you afterwards that have got some really great yeah and they really go I'm, I'm definitely like a science person I like that evidence backing so as I sort of read into that and I really understood a lot of that um, ATP did some really good podcasts on breast implants and how they affect the immune system I'd only really been looking into it for about a month and within that month I'd already booked in with my surgeon and had the date booked um, and I was still only just really learning about it properly but I just knew inside myself intuitively that they just had to go I just I didn't need to know much more they just had to go but after that is when I really started to look into it and it it was quite frightening the health effects that they can cause how they trigger the immune system how the body attacks them all the pathogens that can grow in there yeah so I because I am a practitioner I also was able to do a really comprehensive blood testing on myself and I had noticed some unusual things happening in my blood works with my immune markers my thyroid markers And I then ran my bloods again three months after and I was actually really, really shocked to see the changes that had happened in my blood work. So I went from, you know, having hypothyroidism to, it was four months, sorry, after that where my levels were 
most perfectly in the range. Um, my white blood cell markers had come back to a normal range. My inflammatory and acidity markers had improved. And that was just enough of a proof and testament to myself that I just knew I'd done the right thing. And it's just exciting to be able to share that and the information behind it, like the actual um, studies on it as well. Yeah, that's really incredible that you saw you were able to do those blood works and from a, yeah. a scientific a scientific and an evidence-based perspective, mm. um, be able to see the changes in your own body. Yeah. And it's such, such a brave thing to actually go ahead and do that. Yeah. For women that have implants, if they're having autoimmune issues, mm. would you highly recommend that they look yeah. into the effects of the breast implants? A hundred percent, especially. And even if they're sort of showing signs of, you know, of autoimmunity and they haven't been diagnosed yet, it's really not something to risk or if they've got like a family history of it. So with the implant, it really is, you know, when we think about it, it's a foreign body. It's in our body. Our bodies know it's not meant to be there. So our immune system starts to attack it and tries to protect us from it. So what can happen is, one, the immune system gets suppressed when it comes into contact with other things because it's so busy attending to the implant. And secondly, with time, when the immune system is so active, um, attending to the implant, sometimes it then can't distinguish the difference between its own tissue and the implant. So that's where we can then start to trigger some autoimmune conditions. So probably isn't a smart idea for anyone with autoimmunity or a history of it or signs of it um, to get implants. Yeah, I definitely would not recommend it. Yeah, that's a really key point. And I hope that women who are thinking about getting implants mm -hmm. listen to this. And even if you ha do have mm -hmm. them and have some uh, autoimmune issues that you look a little bit further into it. So Michelle mentioned some um, some sites earlier, which I will include in the show notes so that if you want to do a little bit more research, you can go ahead and do that. So thanks so much for sharing all of that, Michelle. And autoimmune, is it seems to be um, almost in fashion these days mm -hmm. because so many people are, are struggling with mm -hmm. autoimmune issues. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's a real thing and yeah I think nutrition plays a part in that as well and lifestyle. Absolutely 100% but what so many people didn't know is that things like these foreign objects these mm. implants in the body yeah. also play a part. So yeah. uh, going back to before you had your implants removed what made mm -hmm. you get the implants and, and how old were you? I was only 22 so I was like I said previously like I was always on the leaner slightly skinnier side so I didn't have any breasts. Um, and at that age, you know, you, you're you young, you're silly, you you know, you think I want to feel more feminine. I want to, you know, for me it felt like I want to have them to feel like a woman. Um, so I was quite impulsive of doing it. So I went and got a loan and did it like didn't even really think about it. I'm quite impulsive in when I do something. So it was just one of those things that I just jumped on and did and I had them, my first pair in for three years. Then I actually went and had them redone um, three years after that. So in total, I had implants in for 10 years. And, you know, I, I feel like I told myself it was for me that I had them done. Um, but I think it actually was before I even competed. So it wasn't just competing that influenced me. I think I had other people around me at that time that were having them done. So it became so normalized and I think that's why I just didn't really think probably as smartly you know the 22 Michelle was very different to the 33 year old Michelle so yeah it was probably just one of those things I, I put so much emphasis in on how I looked um, so I think that's probably what led me to do that at that time. I think we could all say that um, looking back, you know, 10, 11, 15 years, we were probably very different people and made very different decisions. So <laughs> it's absolutely, absolutely um, yeah. re and relatable. So, and you know what? I don't actually regret it. Um, obviously, if I knew what I knew now, my decisions may have been different. But at that time, they did serve a purpose for me. They did help with some of my successes with competing but I probably put too much importance on that. But I'm also grateful that I get to now be in a position to help other people know the effects of them. And, you know, I've had lots of women 
messaged me who've either had their implants removed and it was something that they saw that I'd put up that gave them the courage to do that or the drive to do that. And then also people who had been booked in for surgeries that have cancelled at last minute when they've seen something. So I feel like, you know, everything happens for a reason and it's now put me in a position where I can help get that awareness out there. Yeah, well, that's that's definitely um, serving a bigger purpose, isn't it? And one of my philosophies is to change one life is to change many. So through yeah. your own journey of going through having them, your own health issues, and then deciding to remove them and the experience and and testing you've done other afterwards, yeah. like you just said, you have had women message you who have made decisions that are huge life impacting decisions. So that must feel really quite rewarding for you. Yeah, really good. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to talk to you about your silent retreat. <laughs> Some years yeah. back, I, you know, knowing you briefly and sort of through social media, mm. I found out that you were turning everything off and going away. Was it to the yeah. mountains or? Well, I've been on three 10 okay. day uh, silent meditation retreats. They're called Vipassana. Um, and one of them was in the Blue Mountains, one was in Adelaide. Uh, um Murray River and then the other one was in Victoria so I in one year I went to three of them yeah which was pretty big wow what was going on for you to decide to do that because it's not just oh, people struggle mm. to meditate for yeah. 20 minutes or an hour let mm. alone going away on a silent retreat tell us yeah. a little bit more about that and what yeah. the driving factors like the deeper driving factors were yeah. for you to go away and do this I've always had a more spiritual background and I think that's been a really big part of my life. I've grown up around that. So I have been on meditation retreats before, like when I was younger. Um, so I signed up to the Vipassana. My mum had actually done it before and she told me about it and I thought it was definitely something I wanted to try. Um, so the first one I went to, um, it was at a really perfect time in my life. My work was really crazy at that time and, you know, when you coach people you're very connected to people and very contactable so it was just nice to go somewhere where you had to hand your phone in you weren't allowed to talk to anyone you weren't allowed to speak you weren't allowed to read you just had to be with yourself um and we did sit for about 10 hours a day in meditation um so really your eyes were closed more than they were open you forget what your voice sounds like you sort of it was an opportunity where you got to just strip yourself away on many levels and even how you identify yourself on a personality level um, and you really just go within. Um, for me, like it brought up a lot of stuff that I feel like I was able to let go of as well just from, you know, childhood and just things like that that, you know, it, we don't often just sit in silence and reflection. Um, but it was the most amazing experience of my life. It was probably the most horrible experience, the most painful experience, but also the most life-changing experience um, that when I came back into the world, I felt like everything was heightened again. Like, you know, I was just so more, so much more present. My mind was so much quieter. Um, you know, just little stimuli was so heightened, like colours and sounds and looking up and, you know, being in the moment with someone, you weren't overstimulated with phones and technology and social media. I just feel like the first time I went to it, when I came back into the world, I felt like it was a reset button and I could kind of live my life from a different place and not be so caught up in that rat race of life. Um, and that's what inspired me to want to do more. Um, and that's why I went back and did two more after that before I had yes. right. That That is absolutely incredible. Like your description of all of that makes yeah. me want to go and explore it. And I'm sure. Everyone has to do it. You're never the same person after. It is the most beautiful experience. Yeah. You learn a lot of philosophies there as well. Like it's, I could not recommend that more to people. Like you really get to just reset yourself and come back in the world different. We're so busy being busy these days and, yeah. and with the pull of, you know, the phone and the device and all the information mm. and social media in your hand, it's so hard for people to to really know themselves. Yeah, and be present, yeah. Life's just happening. It's like no one's actually in it. Yeah, and people are in a rush to get to mm -hmm. the next point, to the next milestone, yeah. to the next yeah. place or thing rather than yeah. enjoying. Just, it's about the journey really rather than exactly. that destination. Yeah. Yeah, because that, you know, that destination point moves all the time. And if you're constantly chasing something or trying to strive for something, you just miss out on the moments happening now. And that's really just life happening. Um, so it's just learning, yeah, just to just stop and just be and accept and be grateful what's, for what's happening now. 
So I am going to ask, I'm assuming that you do, but do you meditate regularly now? Yeah, every day. Um, after I did Vipassana, I sat for an hour every single day for a month. Then my practice just got a bit disrupted and I found I put too much expectation on myself that if I couldn't sit for an hour, then it was almost like all or nothing. Then I realised I just needed to find a happy medium. So I now sit for 30 minutes every morning without fail. So I do, my morning ritual is I get up, I meditate for half an hour, I write in my gratitude journal, um, and then I allow my day to start after that. And no phone, nothing gets turned on, nothing comes into my world until those things are done. And everyone, in, I wake up at 5.30 a.m., so everyone in my house is asleep, so they're my, like, golden hours, <laughs> that <are> my precious, <laughs> just my precious things for me to just set myself up for the day. I can absolutely relate, and it's it's so important to note that People who are successful in whatever field they are in do mm. have a morning discipline routine. Mm. They they do have those rituals and they do have the discipline to sit down and follow through with them on a daily basis because mm-hmm. setting yourself up in the morning is so important to actually win your day, whether you're exactly. competing or whether, you know, you're building um, a, a new business or you run a global empire. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. Um, And once you've done it long enough, it's so habitual, you don't even have to think about doing it. It's no longer an effort. It's such a routine, like brushing your teeth. So I think the trick is just to sustain it long enough that it becomes effortless to do it. You actually feel funny if you don't do it. Yeah, like if you don't brush your teeth. Yeah. (laughs) I'm up nice and early as well because the same, like you said, the the golden hours, Mm -hmm. that's time that I have the nice, quiet I can hear the birds outside and the kids and the craziness um, of the morning hasn't started, although I am still working on making the meditation like brushing the teeth. I still mm-hmm. have to – I love it. I realise the benefits of it, but mm-hmm. it's still not just like getting up and brushing your teeth. I still have mm-hmm. to put the effort into doing it, whereas yeah. some other parts of my morning routine are just normal now for me. Yeah. Meditation has been maybe a year, a year and a half. Um, mm-hmm. on and off, you know, I yeah. fall off the bandwagon and then I get back on. Do you have any uh, any advice, any tips for someone who is trying to incorporate meditation on the daily? I think trying different styles of meditation, not everything. If someone's mind is so loud and so active, sometimes they just need something to focus on um, to calm the mind, whereas not everyone can just sit in silence. The, the brain wants to do something. So whether you're listening to a guided meditation, whether you're doing a visualisation, whether you're just listening to music or a mantra, like I think the best advice is to try some different things and what works for you at that time. Um, and then ideally you want to sort of be able to sit with yourself and observe your own mind um, is usually a really effective form of meditation, but that's not for everyone straight away because um, I think the mind doesn't want to be quiet and it wants to think about what you're doing for the day and then you get itchy because you're like, I want to be productive and get my day started. It's, it sort of feels like oh, I'm sitting here not doing anything, but you actually are doing so much. So, yeah, I think just trialing different styles of meditation to start with. You have just described me <laughs> um, at various times of doing meditation. I, I've i tried different types and at different t- mm-hmm. at different times, um, different styles have worked for me. So the guide had worked for me because for a while mm. there because it stopped my brain from, you know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. what you described, going yeah. everywhere else <laughs> rather than being present. So when you say observe your own mind, mm. what do you mean? So what does that mean? Well, I guess you could think of it as there's, you know, the two minds. So there's the thinking mind and then there's the observer that's watching that thinking mind. So there's the me that's on autopilot thinking like, oh, this happened and then this is how I feel about this and that. And then there's that other part of me that's like, oh, I just caught that thought. Like that's not really serving me. I'm observing it, putting some light on it. So there's sort of the two minds. So there's the chattery sort of ego mind and then there's that mind that can actually be present and observe that thinking mind and sort of detach from that thinking. So um, that sort of just bringing yourself outside of yourself to some degree and watching those thoughts rather than becoming those thoughts. I love that. So watching the thoughts rather than becoming the thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Just sort of stops that chain reaction of this thought leads to this thought and this, you know, and they say like 80% of our thoughts, what we have 80,000 thoughts a day and about 80% of them are generally negative because we're in, we're hardwired for survival. So our brain will naturally go there, but the more you can observe your mind, you stop that chain of thinking. It's that um, self-awareness, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. 
I love it. I could talk about this sort of stuff forever, <laughs> but we are going to move on to <laughs> talk, yeah, to talking a little bit more about um, your vegan way of eating. I know mm-hmm. typically bodybuilding, that's mm-hmm. not the way you eat, although mm-hmm. things are definitely changing. Um, you chose to go down the path of a vegan way of eating and you coach um, champions, including your husband, um, yep. in bodybuilding through eating mm-hmm. in a vegan style. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit more about the benefits of that. Yeah, so um, I, I believe we've been eating that way for about four, coming close to four years. I wouldn't call myself a vegan. Um, I have dabbled back with some, you know, I have the occasional honey um, or I've had, you know, eggs maybe once every couple of months. Um, but naturally I just come back to, I feel intuitively my body doesn't want to eat those things. So I might, you know, if it's there or someone's made something, I'll have it. Um but there's just not something that I would generally have a part of my day-to-day eating. But um, originally, I guess what inspired moving to m- more of that vegan plant-based style of eating was, you know, for starters, I think there was a lot of information going out there about, I guess, the animal side of it, which I didn't think I'd be so affected by. But I think sometimes when you watch one too many things, you, it's just something in you that can't go back. But then I explored more the health side of it and, you know, I had had a lot of digestive issues and one of those was maybe my bowels didn't move as well as they probably should have. So I did notice eating more plant-based, but plant-based eating, there's different approaches to it. Some people go really high carb. Some people go more like healthy fats and seeds and that sort of side of plant-based eating. And I feel like I'm better with not a really high carb approach. I like the more healthy fats um, and tempeh and fermented um, protein sources and that sort of thing. So um, I did notice my body just agreed with it more. I feel lighter. My digestion's so much better. My energy's so much better. So from my own experience, my body told me it felt better eating that way. And then obviously like learning more into, you know, how our intestinal tract works and how we break down meat and that um, it just made me, and particularly the dairy is a big one. I think there's more and more information coming out about the effects of dairy on our health and once you start to look at that from again that scientific background it just makes sense that maybe we're not designed to eat a lot of those foods yeah I absolutely agree I don't I don't like labeling eating mm. a certain way so I've been known to say you know I have eaten a paleo way I have eaten mm. completely gluten-free and vegan for or vegetarian for a little mm. while I generally don't eat dairy but it's I guess sometimes people get caught up in labeling it and yeah you spoke about eating intuitively there Mm -hmm. I guess it's more about understanding and feeling and being in tune with what is working what is not working with your body and sometimes we need a clear I mean feel Mm -hmm. free to disagree because you are the practitioner here we need Mm -hmm. to sort of clean our body out to then Mm -hmm. know what it is that Mm -hmm. our body isn't happy with yeah in terms of food Yep. and it comes back to being like overstimulated that no one is listening to their bodies feedback or that communication system so often if you eat something you might feel bloated or tired but people are so busy being busy that they don't put that connection to oh wait a minute I just ate that and now I feel like I've got a headache or I'm really tired but there's they're so disconnected that nobody actually knows how they feel or or how the food's making them feel and then they're also a bit addicted to certain foods so we know like certain processed foods or refined sugar or there's some things that make our brain want more and dairy actually is one of those foods that have an addictive nature to them because there's some like casomorphines in there which give us like a drug-like effect so we sometimes aren't ready to give up things because we're just a bit addicted to those foods even Uh, though they don't make us feel good (laughs) yeah that's quite interesting I I knew that obviously dairy isn't great and don't Mm. eat it very often but I didn't realize that it had an addictive nature obviously you hear about sugar and things like that being very addictive but never dairy well, it's funny because the conversation that I have with some people, they say, oh, I could give up everything, but I can't give up cheese. And cheese is a really concentrated form of dairy. And that's where there's high amounts of casomorphine, which is what a mother cow produces to go into the milk. So the baby cow is kept a little bit docile and will stay near mum. Um, so it gives you that like brain effect, like almost like a morphine-like effect. So, yeah, it's interesting because people are so um, – attached to certain foods that they can't give up but they don't understand why that is wow that's really really interesting and a a new piece of information that I was completely unaware of I'm definitely going to share that one with my sons because I've taken them off dairy for a long time but I have one who particularly loves Mm. cheese (laughs) Mm -hmm. 
I will um, so, send you some doctor, uh, vegan doctors that um, share some really good information more uh, on the science behind it. That and, would be incredible yeah. and I'll, I'll share yeah. that in the notes as well. Mm-hmm. For someone who is wanting to listen more to their body, what, what would you suggest in terms of just making some changes if they they don't even know where to start? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sometimes it can seem overwhelming to completely radically change your diet unless you've got yeah. some major health issues going on and then that there's the trigger. But yeah. if you're just wanting to improve your health and your eating, mm-hmm. what's a, a way that isn't overwhelming and mm-hmm. can seem achievable for someone to do that? Yeah. Um, my best advice would be add the good stuff in before removing anything. So, you know, making an effort to drink more water would be number one because often we may overeat because we're really thirsty and most people in this day and age do not drink enough water my second advice would be fill up on more vegetables because that's at least going to keep you nice and satiated and give your body the nutrients it needs that maybe it's not getting from the other foods which is also triggering hunger because the body's trying to source a certain nutrients then i'd really suggest to just start to pay more attention so if you're eating something like pay attention to how do you feel before you eat that food how do you feel while you're eating that food and how do you feel 20 30 minutes and the next day like think about your digestion your energy um just paying attention is really important because i think once your body gives you that feedback if you eat something and you feel so like shit (laughs) then naturally you will gravitate to not wanting to eat that food when you get a loud enough signal back from your body that it's not feeling good then you that's one way to already start to make a change um so you know just listening to that dialogue as well like what's what are your eating reasons like often we know what healthy food is but we generally don't eat enough of it and most of us know what unhealthy foods are or the more um common ones uh, the more obvious ones sorry but we often will make lots of excuses to maybe eat more of those things so it's just starting to pay attention to ourselves like what excuses are we giving to you know are we rewarding ourselves with food is it special occasions that we're allowing certain things in so it's just sort of being more aware of like you know the conversations we're having you know how if we say oh I'm just gonna splurge out this weekend and then start eating healthy on Monday like you know where's that coming from like like just listening to our dialogue around food and then also just paying attention to how our body is responding to certain foods would be my best advice, like a really good starting place. Yeah, they're, they're um, three amazing tips and it keeps coming up. It's it's that you speak about body awareness and your body's feedback. So I think that it is, is really important and it's all connected with mm-hmm. what is going on inside your your mm-hmm. thoughts and, and a lot of your past. The food is mm-hmm. what we do with food is certainly connected, at least it was for me, with um, things that yeah. have happened in the yeah. past and, and emotional connections so yeah. majorly yeah we eat when we're happy we eat when we're sad we're trying to fill a void we're lacking sweetness in life like um we're anxious and we want to eat to calm ourselves like yeah food has become like a drug-like substance so it's i think just being aware of ourselves is so so important and powerful for more permanent change not short-term change yeah, um, so much great information, guys. I hope that you have been taking notes, even go back and re-listen to some of what um, Michelle has shared, especially around the food and, and the body awareness and body feedback. Mm. Michelle, I want to ask you, do you have any regrets? You spoke about the implants. You say you don't regret them, but do you have any regrets in life in relation um, to your health and your journey? I wouldn't say any regrets as such, but... Um, cause I, you know, ultimately I think everything we go through prepares us for, you know, who we, you know, it's lessons we need to learn or strengths we need to build. But I feel like maybe there was a period in my life there that I wasn't living true to myself, that maybe I also got caught up in that image side of things. And, um, you know, I do, I, I know I really reflected on myself at one point when I had gone away and I just sort of felt like I was really looking at what I was putting out there and the messages I was sending out there. And I really, I asked myself one question. I said, I hadn't had children then, but I had asked myself, like, if my children saw the sort of content I was putting out there and, and really emphasizing on the body and how it looks, would I be proud of that? And I would felt like I wasn't proud of that. So that's probably what made me realize, like, I don't want to conform to what everyone else is doing because it's not true to me. I'm just being maybe influenced by that. And that's probably looking back at that period of my life. Yeah. Just maybe not living true to myself, but then being able to turn that around and 
um, realize like who am I, what sort of messages do I want to put out there, what sort of influence do I have want to have on the world. So I'm just grateful I had that opportunity to just reevaluate those things so I could turn it around. And that's an absolutely wonderful question to ask yourself. And personally, I know that there there are a lot of people that we know who have done the same thing, and a lot of people um, that we know that haven't, and and maybe need to. Um, when I first started using social media, because when I first competed, I didn't use, didn't have social media, didn't know anything about competing, <laughs> had never been to a show, had no idea. Second mm. year round, I did have social media and I remember standing um, in front of the mirror at the gym one day going, why am I doing this? Like, <laughs> why am I really doing this? Like, yeah. I think there yeah. was a week and a half or two where I was questioning myself and my motives for what I was doing, mm-hmm. photos mm-hmm. that I would take or post. Why am I doing this? And mm-hmm. the same thing I always said, I don't care about the likes. This isn't about mm-hmm. the likes because if I look forward and my sons are older and they look at what I have posted, will I be proud or Mm. will I be um, embarrassed or ashamed in any way? And I've always used that as a guide, not not to anyone else. I mean, other posts and pictures have been thought-provoking for me, Mm -hmm. but then I just turned it on to myself and kept asking Mm -hmm. myself, what's my motivation behind this? What is my intention with this particular image or picture or wording that I'm putting out there and it certainly helped to keep me focusing on a track and in Mm -hmm. a place where you know I am proud of what I put out there so I think a theme in in this whole interview has been Mm -hmm. self-reflection and Mm self-awareness so Mm -hmm. Michelle do you have a particular book health, spiritual, Mm -hmm. fitness, personal development that is a favorite Mm -hmm. that you would recommend people just doesn't matter what they're doing in life, just pick up and read it. I have so many, but my favourite one that I do come back to a lot is called The Charge Life by Brendan Bajard. And that's, I actually get a lot of my clients even to read that book or, or get it on audio book. And it's, I think it's life changing. And everyone I know who's listened to it say it's life changing. So I definitely think that would be a good one to recommend. All right. I'll definitely pop that down in the notes. It's called The Charge Life by Brendan Bajard. That's the one. Perfect. Now, where can we find you if listeners want to go and find you and connect with you? Um, what do you offer in terms of uh, diagnostic testing, mm-hmm. competition prep, coaching? Let us know. Um, so you can find me on my athlete page, so Michelle Richards Health and Fitness Coach, or my personal Michelle Richards Facebook page. I'm also on Instagram under Michelle Richards Health Coach. And yeah, I offer like in-person coaching, online coaching. I do a lot of integrative lab work. So if someone's got digestive problems, hormone imbalances, um, someone that just wants to maybe, um, you know, reduce body fat or just get healthy or, you know, build a good fitness routine up or want to find a more supportive environment to exercise. um, My business is called The Base. Um, where we have our own private studio where we run female group training classes and we do some challenges and transformation programs. Um, all of our programs are just really tailored to the individual based on their health goals and also their just their own personal goals. Do people have to be located in Adelaide to be able to work with you or, or can they work with you online? Yeah, no, we do offer online programs also. Beautiful. Um, It's been incredible having you on the show and interviewing you. So much golden information there. Do you have a final message for the audience, a parting thought or or an action item that you'd really encourage them to just go out and do? My best advice would be to unplug for a little bit and, like you said, you know, that self-reflection. Like we don't want to get to the end of our life not having truly lived our life true to ourselves so I think spending some time to do some self-development um really identifying what are your values you know what do you want your life to be about you know the questions like at the end of your life what will truly matter like actually ask yourself those questions now and you will then find it will put you on a path to live your true life not a life that's been influenced by the you know things around you like family friends social media because often we're just conforming a little bit and we all want to fit in it's a a human need but with that comes compromising yourself so I think you know go on a meditation retreat or um you know do some journaling at night time or um 
yeah, just go within yourself and ask yourself some of those powerful questions and then take the steps to truly live to that. Absolutely. That is wonderful advice. Questions Mm -hmm. really are the answers. And sometimes Mm -hmm. asking those questions, we don't Mm -hmm. actually know the answers. What are your values? Sometimes you ask yourself, we ask people and it's like, actually, I don't know. So it's that quiet time that that you've suggested, I think, which is Mm -hmm. so, so important to be able to to work through that and, and understand that. And then obviously it'll impact the choices that you make in life. So you don't wake up one day Mm. with a bucket list of regrets in life yeah that's so, true that would be the worst <laughs> so yeah michelle it has been absolutely incredible chatting with you i love always love talking to you you're you're a wealth of knowledge thank you so much thank you i really appreciate it it's been such a pleasure thank you so much for listening to the show i truly hope you have found it beneficial and have taken some value from it hopefully a lot If you did, please, please share this show with anyone you feel may need to hear it. I would also absolutely love if you would take a minute or two to review this show on iTunes, Stitcher, or whichever platform you happen to be listening to it on. With your help, we can accomplish my mission to positively impact 10 million lives. That would be so awesome. Now, if you want to connect with me or my guests on other platforms, or if you want to send me an email with questions or ideas of guests to interview, please check out the show notes. I am so incredibly grateful to have had your time today and I can't wait to have you on the next episode. Have a great day.